points and I work here. I think uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we are running very late and I think some people have trains to catch which are not as indeterminate as, uh, as Florian's landscape. So uh, we, I think the, 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 the suggestion is that we go straight into the, the discussion. So maybe uh, uh, if I could ask uh, those people who presented earlier today, I, uh, Florian, Sonan, come here and uh, Instead of making the, I suppose, presentation that I was going to, to make, I could just start by making some uh, sort of uh, comments that might lead to, uh, to a discussion. Um, I think it's, uh, it's uh, an odd thing that I've been here now over five years and we've uh, never had a, a conference on CORB and uh, next Saturday we're going to have a conference on CORB and uh, you know it's uh, it's strange that the ghost of CORB is not going to uh, to go away so the, 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 the first time the one time that we do something on on uh, on herring uh, we'll end up with uh, CORB being the following week which is uh, um, an interesting thing um, and in a way um, I think that's one of the things that I think is, is, is worth discussing to my mind, it's, uh, it's now a little bit of a pity. No, no, leave it for one minute. Sorry. It's a pity that the, the, the discussion about, uh, about Hugo Herring is always uh, bracketed in the light of uh, this dualism between, um, uh, between Corbin Herring, between uh, modernism and, and an alternative uh, tradition, because while I, I can see so many of the benefits, it's, it's always reflecting in relation to a past, in relation to this history, and becomes in many respects affirmative of that history uh, in terms of comparison rather than at times focusing on what are the key issues that, let's say, come up in the work of Sharon or, or, or Herring, which might then be the basis for further conversations in relation to contemporary practice, which I think it has been uh, very much at the heart of many of the presentations uh, today. Just by way of getting the conversation going, therefore, um, and um, to, to um, speed things up, it seems to me that it might be worthwhile to try and focus on some issues in more detail rather than uh, the, uh, the general historical presentation. And one of the things that obviously comes up is the, uh, the discussion of, uh, of form and the relation between form and function. And I, the, the, the um, other topic that uh, is presented um, in, uh, in Peter's work and, and in, in relation to the work of Herring is, uh, is the issue of new building. Maybe those might be two of the topics that I think have very much a relevance to the question of contemporary practice. And I think it would be interesting if we could point? pick that up. Yeah. New building. New building. Mm -hmm. um, with reference to this question of, uh, of form, uh, in the catalog that uh, was made for the exhibition, Peter has the first sentence on the, on, the, on the Gorkow form, and he says that the form is Herring's best known work and a key example of modernist functionalism, both for its organization and its express construction in contrasting materials. Its historical significance lies more in the principle of form finding that it exemplifies than in advances it brought to agricultural practice, even if these were also notable at the time. So the, the emphasis that you're placing is on the question of form. But at the end of, of that section, there's also a, a, a little quote from, uh, from, uh, uh, from Herring's own article on the, on the cowshed. And Herring says, thus the form gestalt of this building has been discovered Gewonnen as the result of a search dedicated to the achievement of the form that expresses the claims of performance fulfillment in the simplest and most direct manner. So while uh, Herring is also acknowledging the question of form, I wonder what this performance fulfillment is that he's, he's after in relation to the question of form. Now, I think the irony is that whenever then the discussion of, of form comes out in relation to function, then form is legitimized in many ways in terms of how it affirms certain kinds of functions in, 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 in many respects. And the word performance uh, opens up certain, despite maybe what, uh, what uh, Florian was saying, 
opens up certain other possibilities that I think the word function has, is, misses out on in, in many respects. I actually personally don't mind the word use because the word use is the, the, the way in which certain conditions of function are actualized in terms of their everydayness, going back to what Sandy was talking about. So therefore, the word performance or the performativity that Herring refers to could be in some way seen to be something which is not then limited in, in, in relation to function, but becomes more broadly something that is the use, the activity, whatever it is. But how do we then now, in terms of the contemporary situation, understand this condition of, of performance and performativity? That's sort of one question that maybe might be of relevance. I mean, I could go on more about this, but I won't go on. Um, the second thing is the question of new building, which I, I won't sort of um, talk about more, but I think it's, it's, it's very interesting in the sense that it immediately then touches on the question of how one builds, the manner of constructing. And maybe I have one slide, maybe if I could show you the one slide, please. Um, you're going to miss, miss your train. No, I thought it's good. Four o'clock. You have to take a lesson plate. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have an. I have a. Unfortunately. Just in terms of this this question, I don't know if you're familiar. I certainly <coughs> didn't know this, uh, but this is a chair that Hugo Herring did. It's a prototype, yeah. uh, done in 1949. It was done for the exhibition that was in Karlsruhe and uh, in Stuttgart. And it's uh, the first example of a cantilevered chair using this kind of sheet material, which really, in many respects, combines this idea of the relationship between the thinness of the material, the way in which the, the chair itself, if you'd like, in terms of its performative condition. Now, don't think about it just only in terms of sitting, but think in terms of the performativity of the chair in relation to the performance of sitting, whereby the question of the bounciness of the chair the, the, the bounciness of the chair in relation to how it holds up. There's a whole set of iterations that are really resonant in terms of, in terms of the chair itself, but also going back to what I think Sunand was, was attempting to, con to, to construct, a kind of more, um, uh, a different, discussion. sorry? Okay, I'm just gonna finish on this. It's simply that, that it, it presents a way of dealing with, uh, with the issue of, of materials, how they construct also uh, the form. So that relationship between material and form, or material and new building, that might be another thing that we could, uh, we could discuss. So maybe with those two topics, we could open the conversation. I don't know if Nasser wants to uh, come here. So how shall we do this? Would you like to respond from here, or I think we have had a lot of presentations and haven't had a chance to hear from the audience. So I'd rather go to the gentleman over there who would like, who wants to say something. Please go ahead.
Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's in uh, one of the inevitable conditions of the architect of the 20th and 21st century that you have to do the serial house. And of course, uh, some of those, I mean, the little vaulted house and the terraced houses were for unknown clients, and so that was taken as part of the brief. I think what Herring did um, more than the others was every time there was a site plan, the site plan responded to what, what, uh, whatever the given shape of the site was, and he always had several different types, um, and he played variations on them. So he created as much differentiation as possible, whereas a lot of the others were prepared to let it run on mechanically. With with uh, with which bit? Well, with, the, with the concept of, of, of varying the layout and the story, yeah. not just rounding it out in the way that you you said. I mean, both the union and the anonymous clients, and uh, apart from the interesting innovations that Herring did with the insulation and the sort of constructions and so on, which were which were technically very interesting, but apart from in in, in design terms and in response. To Well, except that they, you know, the, they're, they're fairly simple and straightforward plans uh, because they had to be done very economically. But in any case, that, that all that is, in a sense, c um, communal work because the site plans were determined really in groups. I mean, Siemensstadt, it's Schroon in the um, Uncle Tom's Hütte, it's Taut, also setting the parameters of the buildings. So what the different architects were doing is comparable. But I mean, I think if you look at the site plan uh, schemes for Herring's own unbuilt housing projects, it's the, um, it's the differentiation of types which would um, most differentiate them from those of other people at the time. Yeah. Um, I think Hannes Meyer said that architecture is function times economics. And uh, this is a, a formula Well, it's, it, it's an interesting thought that, for instance, somebody like Alto said he would have nothing to do with the Maison Minimum because he doesn't think you should make it an option. I mean, that's ambitious, if you like, but, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's perfectly obvious that if you haven't got much money and you're a politician and you want to be able to show that you built a house, then you will do like the mass-produced system in Russia where the cheapest thing is a concrete panel and it has one hole in it whether it's a living room a bedroom a bathroom or whatever it is the cheapest it's the quickest to do and and so on and it's not a question of being snooty if you say you won't do that it's a question of actually believing very very strongly what you ought to be offering. Um, so I think the Maison Minimum isn't an argument that helps us to talk about what we're talking about now.
Well, no, I don't think you've got my point. My point is that a highly individualized functional design is just as reductive. I mean, an industrial designer who is designing a, a, an engine or something uh, will calculate uh, a shape for a particular engine that is custom designed for a particular purpose, and it will be a unique design. Um, it won't be a generalized, standardized module. Nevertheless, in terms of the sources of its expressivity or otherwise, uh, it's no different. Well, I mean, there's, there's the other category that falls between those two things in any case, which, which was the school of thought that said that you make a design such that it contains options which the occupant can take advantage of or manipulate, uh, which is coming much nearer to trying to work within the economic limit but give the individual the freedom to do what, what they want and to particularize where they want. I mean, it's a very grand ambition, but um, there have been various projects along those lines, haven't there? Well, I mean, I, I think um, Giancarlo de Carlo's um, Matsobo has, it, yes. where he was trying to uh, pick up on the general culture of the people involved. You know, he thought that that the participation wasn't a matter of giving everybody exactly what they wanted house by house, <coughs> but of finding out what the local culture was um, and then building mass housing which responded to that. So, I mean, I suppose that's the, that would be my answer to your question. I think there's a hell of a lot of difference between making little courtyard houses and making uh, ruddy great 18-storey blocks. But I think Brian's saying uh, his question is about what, what constitutes value, that actually both of those, that may be true, there's a difference, but whether whether you can say, you know, it doesn't actually tell you by just from those facts what the value is behind either of those moves are. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? So, so the question, the trouble is nobody will admit to not having value. I mean, nobody will say, well, actually, I don't give a shit. You know, I, I'm, I'm just doing what, uh, well, very few are, are honest enough to say that. Uh, although maybe it may, may be true of large numbers of, uh, in actual practice, aren't they? Uh, so, so what it, how do you, you know, either this question is a red herring or it really has something underneath it. And I, I find it helpful to first separate whether you're talking about the process of making and doing or whether you're talking about the process of habitation or the reception mm. of the work mm. by this context in which it is. Mm. In the process of making or doing, anything goes. Mm. You know, everybody's given a different reason here, all apparently irrational or apparently uh, underpinned by sets of values. You know, for Florian, the values are in the trace of the landscape. Other people would say, well, that's a complete waste of time, really. You know, it's all in the past. For other, uh, you know, others, uh, earlier, Volker said uh, something about not wanting buildings to reach the ground, that if the, 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 the building could come from the sky. Well, that's, that's a passionately held position, which you may or may not share. And it, you know, proof of the pudding for us is in, in, in you know, at, at one point, I don't, uh, I can say, in past period, I don't really care what, what the reasons are. I'll eventually find the work and respond to it and induce my own values into it. So I think that unless you separate the two, I don't know how, uh, but, how we but, discuss but values. But one of the things that I thought uh, <coughs> one could get at is that it's it's the, the reception is not only after the fact, it's also creating the yeah. conditions whereby certain certain particularities could be developed through the design. So the mechanism of design also explores these things. And, and the, the concept of performance, for example, is one of the ways in which um, the, 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 the question of what the work is doing, what its performative conditions are, can be discussed. So what are the, what are the ways in which questions of performativity could be developed, could be discussed, could be designed? What is the relation between performativity I think that is something that um, could equally apply to the high rise as well as to the to the unique. That that seems to be the thing that I think is. is, is well, of course, the, the trouble is that uh, traditionally, I mean, with the with the vernacular, pre-industrial vernacular, there was a feedback process automatically that the people who built it used it. So it's they experienced it, and they had a cultural tradition of doing it in that way and it was in a continuous state of, of experiment. 
Whereas when the whole um, process is broken and there are an enormous number of um, professionals and bureaucrats in the chain in between, um, you know, there's a complete break between one end and the other and people are expropriated and they no longer have power over it and they lose interest. Um, and so then it can become either a bureaucratic product or it can become um, a piece of willfulness on the part of the architects equally if they're the people who've got the power over it. So I, I think that's a, that's a lot of the problem and that, that actually Herring is deeply romantic wanting to, 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 you know, to develop the essence of farm in a way that's really kind of 18th or 19th century that has to do with that kind of agricultural procedure which puts all its capital and all its value into its buildings in a kind of direct way. It's already probably disappearing by the beginning of the 20th century, but, but he's making a kind of romantic statement about that possibility and about that tradition. And I don't think that tradition needs to have died or needs to have faded out, but we certainly would have to combat the enormous chain of finance and bureaucracy and design and all the rest that's come in between, um, you know, the design of the building and the users. I'm not sure he came from that uh, area, Peter. But if you, uh, um, Sandy was talking earlier on about the, the historical background and the uh, English uh, uh, architectural influences on modern movement. And uh, a man called uh, Chancellor in the 1850s was building modern farms in uh, this country which catered for similar numbers of cows and exactly the same kind of relationship as with Gut Gut Gut. But the outcome was quite different. And it was very functionalist. It had little railway lines coming down, bringing everything in. Mm. It was very much along the lines of industrialized processes. And that uh, whole, uh, I mean, if you look at Chancellor's work, it's quite so different. Well, yes, I mean, I, I, well, I agree with you about those 19th century farms, but I mean, I think it does go back um, earlier than that. And the one, one, one sees it in the examples in the Open Air Museum, you know, where your, your wealth is visible in the size of your barn and even in the size of your, your dung heap, and your whole economy is operating um, in a kind of visible way in front of you, because there's not another way that you can uh, spend it, really. Yeah. <coughs> Yes, but I also I think, you know, Peter is referring to when he discusses function and, and let's say the form, the form is an embodiment of this function. Yeah. When I'm talking about performance, the form does not need to embody mm -hmm. this. I mean, it's probably closer to what Brian is, mm -hmm. is saying in the sense that, let's say, we go back to, to the example of Laurie Baker that, uh, that uh, Patrick okay. referred to. Laurie Baker is building very inexpensive houses costing a thousand pounds or whatever in India, and these houses have a performative condition which is not related to them embodying their function, but they actually perform their, their, their function in the sense that the quality of light, the way that the shadows work, the way that it has to be cool in the summer, all of that, this is part of the performativity of the building. On the one hand, the users are using it, but on the other hand, the building itself has a performative condition. In that sense, the building is not a representational thing. Of course it is, but it's not its primary task. In the case of what you, how you're discussing form, form and the plan become directly representational in terms of being able to be precisely that still life of, uh, of organization that was, uh, that was referred to. So uh, all I'm saying is that I think it's useful to discuss the tension between performance, between use, and its spatial representations in a way, rather than try and inscribe it on the plan or to try and embody it. I, I yeah, I think I, I, I mean I don't I don't I think you're sort of painting me into a corner there. I, I don't think it's that rigid. Or that's, that's I think it's a <laughs> more of a reciprocal relationship that's what I'm, that's what I'm between the two. But I mean, <laughs> but 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 I mean there is a relationship between the two, and there should be, and that's what's that's what's important. I mean, with when I was showing the examples of the Saline de Show, the two versions, 
it's, it is really important where the chapel is. It's not, a, it's not an irrelevant question. Yeah, but it may, may be important where the chapel is, but perhaps not okay. so important where the sort of uh, 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 is in the, in, in the, and you call this, uh, you call these things kind of uh, moments of uh, moments of living and moments of life that are worth uh, sort of fixing in the form, yeah? and I think that. Well, there That's are, a bit dogmatic. There, 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 are, there are rituals of cooking as well, but that opens up a whole other area. I'm going to have to go. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, the only thing that I, I, I felt actually about the day is that a lot of friends and doing similar things. The, thing that, the one thing I'd like to say in summing up is I think that it's operating differently at different scales. Um, you know, and, and that when one's talking about a door handle and, and when one's talking about a room, and then when one's talking about putting rooms together to make a society of rooms into a building and what that means, and then one's talking about the building at whole, and then one's talking about the landscape and the, and the lines and wrinkles of the ground, they're all different scales. And they, and, and they operate in, in, in different ways because of that. And uh, I'm slightly worried when a, a painting and a plan look the same. It makes me slightly suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, with that, I, I, I must go or I'll miss my train. Got to get back to the north. Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> I have to say, uh, um, yeah, I, I'm really interested in what's going on, and I'm really interested in this scale question. Uh, I think it's very important now uh, how to build uh, for a mass, how to build uh, individual for a mass. What, 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 what's, uh, I'm, as an architect, it's a question, uh, and it's a question which I'm uh, um, I don't know, I have to say I don't know, but uh, looking at Los Angeles, for example, Los Angeles for me is, is a, a sort of a slum on the highest level. It's, it's, it's very individual on the one side, and it's, it's built by mass, and it, it disappears maybe the next, in, the next time, and the only thing which, which uh, um, will exist then uh, are some traffic lines, some uh, freeway, uh, not lines, it's really the nerves, the infrastructure of this whole landscape more or less. And uh, I think it, what we can, what maybe what we can offer as architects, uh, if we build uh, for, for, for really a big mass, uh, it's only, it's a built infrastructure. It's, it's an architecture as an infrastructure. It's not, a, it's not an infrastructure as you, not, not, not electricity and, and so on and so on. It's, it's an, a built infrastructure where you can, um, uh, built on, uh, on it. Yes. It's yeah. 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 yeah, it's a yeah. 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 Yeah.
in interest in particularity can happen at the urban scale. Why not? Yes, and it's not, and, and, and uh, so-called urbanism doesn't necessarily have to be repetitive um, any more than a building has to be. And particularly, as Wolf Niger has mentioned today, because the economics don't even require that today. Increasingly, we have the same cost for for every panel on Bilbao to be different than if they're all the same. Yeah? So it's so what I'm trying to say is that n number one, the, the the repetition is not anymore an economic um, criteria or becoming less and less important. And similarly, I, I don't agree that the scale, um, one can have an infrastructure, so, uh, uh, a framework for working at the scale of a room as well. Yes. Yeah. So it's not only an urban question there. And the, also the, the other thing, just, just carrying on from that, Bill, is that something I'd like to bring you to this to now is the issue with the specificity and general I just want to uh, uh, reinforce this. I mean, this particularity we are very interested. We are interested in this kind of idea of different geographies uh, at the scale of a room and at the scale of an uh, industrial state. Yeah? The idea of the particularity. Yeah? And, but it doesn't, the particularity does not necessarily uh, come originate only from activity and from use. There are other means huh, with which you can achieve this particularity of character, as it's called. Yeah? And it doesn't only come from this, okay, in this corner I'm playing the piano, and in this corner I'm going to sleep. Huh? Huh? I don't think actually um, that was suggested, um, certainly today, at, um, and also in the, in the, in the catalogue and in my introduction, there was, there's been always emphasis on the place as well as so the idea of whether you actually just design from inside out and you produce um, spaces where you either sleep or rest is not really quite as literal as that. Um, because as we see in some of the 1946 Poitiers house, there are actually spaces which you might say that they are fairly regular and are, they could be bedrooms or not bedrooms. They could be just spaces. But the question I, w I was going to ask was um, from... Um, What point do you think that a space <coughs> becomes equally um, restricted by it being so unanimous and non-particular? I mean, one of the things which I found quite fascinating about the work that you showed earlier on was this idea of the roof and the landscape. I know we had a kind of a brief discussion about that lunchtime about mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the relation between architecture and landscape, and roof and the landscape. Because if you, if you cut this kind of, um, there's something about the roof. Two of your projects, which has
has some kind of relation with Lance but not quite. Um, but, then, um, but then you know. This is the idea of, of uh, natural landscape that sounds a little bit uh, strange, but natural landscape is artificial landscape. And if I, I, I explain architecture as artificial landscape, so I don't want to speak about uh, landscape so much because it's so old fashioned to do that. If, uh, but uh, it, it has to do with this idea that architecture is a let me say a second bench, uh, landscape, it, is, it can react to, to the original landscape. So um, uh, I, I was talking about, uh, about, about uh, this uh, built infrastructure. And this built infrastructure is a, a very, let me say, free, in some way free shaped inf infrastructure because it reacts, as example, to the landscape, to the geography, to the topography of the landscape. So this, uh, this is uh, maybe the first step to to do it individual, it, it's it's a little bit tri trivial, uh, but uh, it could be it could uh, this. Um, it's not a grid, uh, not a rectangular grid, not an orthogonal scheme. It's it's something which really reacts. It can also react uh, to uh, let me contaminated areas. So you don't you don't uh, build uh, you you build above contaminated areas, not on contaminated areas. You can use. Um, landscape you normally can cannot use. And I think it's important because uh, two, two weeks ago I, I, I was in, in Bombay for uh, 10 days or two weeks and I was so shocked, I have to say, not so shocked by the, by the earthquake and, and what, what happened after the earthquake. I was so shocked by the idea that, not the idea, the fact that each month's uh, uh, more than 100,000 uh, uh, people comes to each month to Bombay. And how to, how as an architect, to, re to react, uh, to react uh, only, and there are no, there are, we, we are speaking about city planning, town plan, uh, speaking about, and it's really an academic stuff, really. There are no solutions, nothing, there's really nothing. And we thought about how can it go on? How uh, only to react what what's going on, not uh, to um, let me say to um, uh, yes to, to to give solutions to what what's what's uh, what's um, uh, just happening and what's what's happening in, in uh, to uh, how to say to to uh, 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 going to to the uh, to, Sanian, uh, uh, to, to make uh, healthy. To improve, to improve, to regenerate, to, to, yeah. to regenerate it, at example, existing slums, uh, because also the slums have different. Uh, uh, there are ten different categories of slums in in Bombay. So it's, uh, but to build it, and the, the only idea I had, and maybe it's really the, uh, the, it's really uh, the prototype of a stupid idea, uh, is to build a new slum, but on a higher level. On a very high level, only to react to this ex ex extreme, ex extreme mass of people who really, um, this is a fact. They come, if, if you, if you, if you uh, consider that uh, each year um, there are more than one million people coming to Bombay, it's maybe it's, uh, I'm so shocked because I'm coming from a very small country. So but Marco, this is, it's, it's, it's overwhelmingly an economic question. Yes, but nobody reacts. Nobody. Yeah. There are, there are no that's because of the existence. That's why the, the economic and power structures are, are the way they are, and why people are coming. And this is this is something that has happened before, and it, it's going on happening. But Delhi is expanding at a no, rate that when you go a year later, you don't. You actually can no longer relocate where you were. Yeah, for example, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's actually you can almost see it moving at something like ten meters a day outward. So you know, of course, it's, it's very difficult. To deal with that scale as the, a, a designer, but I think that. But it's a, I think it's important because otherwise it's really an academic uh, uh, discussion what we are, what we have done. Also, I think it's uh, it, it's it's helpful what we did. For for me, it's a, I, I, I I'm much better informed now than I was uh, in the beginning of, of the symposium. And I think it uh, we should do it individual, and it, it's it's possible it's possible to do it also for a mass. I'm sure, but 
And you start with a very low, on a very low um, equipment, equipment is not right, um, with a very low intellectual um, innovation or, or um, yes. Uh, and uh, then it can uh, develop uh, itself to a much better, to much better conditions. And also, then this uh, question of, of form and function, the, I think it's,
And the secondary function is the um, physical function, which applies to the interpretation of the landscape. And the physical function would apply also to the physical part of the body, the physical comfort of the body. And that is like a reinterpretation of um, appreciating art, because that comes in in the <coughs> physical side. So if you want to find a, a human um, interpretation that's suitable for humans, and not cows, somebody mentioned cows, but we're not talking about that, we're talking about humans, then I would go back to these two functions. One of them is the rational function, and we all understand how that rationality is applied to building. And I think that can be deemed a function. And then there's the other function, which is the physical function. And that, and that combines the two human parts you know, of the body. And I think that can be very satisfactory. And it also answers the question about dealing with unknown clients, because you know, they would be able to respond to that. And that would relate to the buildings in India, which would be unknown clients. And those buildings fulfill that requirement as well. They fulfill the physical requirement, but they also fulfill artistically the rational and all the other elements of it. So that's, that was one of that was the observation that I, I thought might answer that question. Those are very general words, physical and rational. Very yes, they are, but function is a general word as well, mm -hmm. I feel. And if you, if, you, um, if you try and think of it as, as true function, then it makes it it makes, I find Karen's work rather uncomfortable. It's kind of difficult to deal with, and I'm glad it's, it's only in small doses. And when I began to think about it in this way, and applying these as strong, rational elements, I found it much, much more um, um, easier to come to terms with. And, and it's probably, you know, maybe that had something to do with the argument that they had at that time. Um, when, you know, they, that, that might have been their feeling as well in, in why they didn't want to have any formal ones at the moment. Can I, can I just, I mean, one, one of the things that um, when, when I was working with the director and I was always trying to sort of get him to, to try and remember clearly was what he felt the problem was in about 1930. I mean, it was, it was, you know, you can talk to old art so easy to talk to old architects and get them to describe what they thought the problem was when they were about 30. And, um, but you kind of work, work at it, you can get them to do that sometimes. And um, old Beckham used to say, by the time he'd um, finished building his flats in Paris, which was lots of charming years ago, he'd sort of more or less come to the conclusion that that struggle between the sort of um, folk tradition, which you know, I'm speaking in very sort of general terms now, the folk tradition which he'd, he'd come across in his travels through Germany, and the rational tradition which he obviously encountered in France, and that struggle was false. Um, and um, he, he remembered when he went to Moscow in, in early, early took photographs of the penguin pool and plans of pipeline. And he said, it was interesting, he said, we went to Moscow expecting to impress, you know, the other Ginsburg, Moshe Ginsburg, and the constructivists and so on, his old friends and mentors. And he was very disappointed at how dismissive they were of pipeline. He said they, they enjoyed the penguin pool. That was a little divertissement. But by the time they'd, they'd got that far, 
aspects of human nature or human personality, it was the, the simultaneous coexistence of those that there was the reality. And that, that in abstract representational terms, that simultaneity should be written into the, into the proposition of the plan, which is why those <coughs> rational lines Well, it's very difficult to be articulate. I mean, one can sort of go on and on, but um, I, I, I was really only trying to make one point, which is that I don't think we have the language for communicating and winding ourselves up um, to fulfill the sort of program that Herring was proposing. We keep going back to the old language the whole time. Um, technology is what's going to determine things or... Um, I mean, I, I find it incredibly sad that, um, that the architectural, uh, the physical architectural repertoire of form that, that kind of was invented in Expressionism was turned into something much more to do with fulfilling a way of life but it has now gone exactly the other way around and with people like Danny Lieberskin and so on we're back at expressionism again <laughs> that same language and what really should be driving it um, is to make it as a vehicle for a pleasurable way of life. I know that sounds terribly bland, but unless you always start at that point and try to find out what is the language of the moment relating to the proposition you're having to deal with, um, you're, you're always going to fall back into the old language, and, and it's hard to find the right words for it. I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe I, I haven't so. Uh, contributed to that at all today, but that's what I've been trying to do. And it's awfully easy to wander off the path. I, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably not being very uh, articulate. But this comes back to Brian's question about value. Mm. There is a huge market for, let's call it expressionism, mm. because actually it's, it's important for both institutions and companies to, to proclaim their difference. And mm. to, to uh, act th that actually, the, the whole architectural project, the way everybody's been describing it today, mm. very much about habitation and about mm. use and that humanist tradition, uh, it's, it's always threatened to be overtaken by a quite different project in which those things are sub, sub, subsets. They're at best to be just satisfied, not celebrated, but that actually it's that branding or the identity of that institution which much more important. And so uh, the love of the new and the seeking of the, of the new, which, which is, uh, which expression provides, is, is therefore very, uh, very marketable and there. And if, if you disagree with it, you'll have to take a stand which will be uh, proof of your, your value system, if, if you do. And I think very few people can afford to <laughs> have the courage to do that. And I think, I think that, that's, that's the, the nexus, I think, where the discussion is, because many would say, no, that's, that's completely legitimate. That's how economies work. That actually is part of function to provide for that uh, expressive need. It's part of function to, to, to demonstrate, because they're in there are embedded values too. Mm. Those forms are embedded values in a bigger project. And so, uh, I said earlier, I always get worried when conversations seem to be more in the first half of the 20th century, uh, mm. which I think I, I, that isn't that I'm, you know, I'm not sort of taking anyone uh, particular, but I think there's a tendency in, you know, given we're talking about figures like Mies and Herring, that uh, would we, would we, uh, it is easy to remain in a in a discussion <coughs> which isn't uh, 
which doesn't really attack what's what's happening today. And uh, that was preparing. To, that there's a terrific essay at the end, but it's like preparing the ground for the real conversation. That essay, which is what the hell do you do now? What the hell do you do now? How do you practice now? What is what are your duties now? I mean, uh, that's we haven't talked about whether a building has succeeded or not and how you measure that um, which is extraordinary um, I mean there's terribly little feedback and it's quite difficult to I mean you can't go around with a questionnaire and say did you like this did you like because you're already shaping the response but um, you know, that, that there are buildings which are loved and appreciated and there are buildings which may be brilliant and people can't live in them. Uh, now, that sort of area of fulfillment or not takes us all the way back to whether the question was formulated properly in the first place, which is what I keep on trying. I mean, I don't think I'm talking about something which is dated because it was talking it talk, talked about either 50 years ago or 5,000 years ago it, it, it's all the same I mean it's a continuous it's a continuous debate um, in, in a society where obviously things are changing but the fundamental thing whether people are happy feel at home in a building or not end of the day, that's the issue. Yes, but I think it's also the question of the relationship between those, those issues and what kind of building you do, what kind of architecture you could do. Because sometimes I think there should also be the assumption that if you know, you can do. I think there is, a, there is an assumption on the part of many architects that if they have the knowledge, for example, of, you know, of what constitutes happiness, then they are also capable of constructing an architecture, which is good. And, uh, there's also a lot of the history of architecture where things have been done in the name of goodness, which are not necessarily very good. So as an example, let's say the work of an architect like Alejandro de Rosota that we have had an exhibition and we have published a book on him and uh, someone like that, becomes interesting because he is exactly dealing with the kind of issues that you are discussing, but also seeing them very much in relation to certain questions and conditions of limits. And these limits are the things that produce the mechanisms for the architecture uh, to be innovative and inventive with limited materials. That goes back to the question about bombing, how you can be innovative, how you can do something with limited materials. Those circumstances, those particular actors. And I thought mm -hmm. that what, what, let's say, someone like Alejandro de la Sota has done also pushes the question of the plan a little bit further because Alejandro de la Sota, with the materials is actually making something which is much more three-dimensional and, and, and spatial in, in, in many ways in terms of the, the way that his work uh, comes, comes into being. In, in that sense, it's also less representational in terms of the imagery, in terms of the facade, in terms of what it communicates. But it, it relies more on a kind of sense of pragmatism, but pragmatism that would be you know, something incredibly <coughs> strong in terms of the imagination of the, of the project. But isn't it, uh, isn't it the question what, what really our criteria? Uh, you said there's pragmatism, uh, uh, economic uh, uh, circumstances and so on. But uh, uh, there's a, a criterion like, uh, like desire or longing or something. I think. We, we, we never, uh, if, I, I, if I'm in a conversation with judge, Beatrice, that I start with this saying, with this talking, everybody, what is, what, what's going on now? So we have to calculate it. Do you understand? Yeah. You can calculate the uh, criteria as desire or longing. I don't know the right word. Yeah, yeah. But, <coughs> but uh, and I think it's very important. And, and also. But it doesn't negate pragmatism, doesn't negate desire. No, doesn't no, no, it doesn't. But no, no, it, uh, I didn't say that, but it, it's, you said it's, it's, a, it's a pragmatism with all this um, sur surrounding, with all this, what's, what's around it, but there's nothing around uh, very often uh, beside pragmatism. There's nothing around beside the calculation and yeah, so on. And, so on. Yeah. and I think it, it's 
also so, so nice uh, because I, I was a little bit, uh, how to say, confused by this um, contradiction between Herring and Mies van der Rohe. Uh, I don't, I know what what uh, Mies van der Rohe built, but for me it's uh, it's 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 really a subtle tool because, as example, to to furnish to furnish uh, uh, a landscape, let me say a landscape. Uh, underneath the roof, it's a nice idea. Sure. It's a very nice idea, and it's a very subtle idea. And also, when he, it's 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 written by Mies van der Rohe. But only a lively inside has a lively outside. So it's not so far away from Mr. Herring. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, and if he says uh, form as a goal always ends up in formalism. Because this effort is not directed towards <coughs> the inner, but towards the outer world. So mm -hmm. it's not so far away from Mr. Herring. So as I, I think some, uh, sometimes we, 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 we really uh, uh, construct these differences. Uh, I, I have yeah. no problem with, with these two personal personalities. I have to say, as I don't say that they are the same, but for me, it's a whole. For me, it's in some way uh, an organic uh, discussion. <laughs> I think, um, I think yeah. can I make another point about that? Because <coughs> the one aspect, uh, I don't feel especially well informed to, to say this with any authority, but the one aspect of both of these architects that hasn't really been uncovered today or referred to is the
Make sure you say something really good. <laughs> 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 Keep waiting. But that's very difficult. The problem I find is if we're looking back at the historic period, mm. which I feel was discussed in terms of you know the people like that historic period still exists. We're in a very different period now. Um, modernism you know, came towards the end of a 400-year period of modernity. It was underpinned by ideas laid down 400 years before, which had to do with you know where science came from, the notions of um, the big idea was the notion of an objective reality, and modernity saw several postmodernisms, romanticism being the first one, the first reaction against it. The next one is um, idealism. Then comes one aspect of modern, modernism. I mean, somebody like Hannes Meyer works within the paradigm of modernity. But somebody like Corbusier, because of his like, spiritual concerns, I mean, Corbusier, you, you can see as a, as a modernist in terms of in the modernity, but also as a, in opposition to it, like Eliot and so on. They, they are, if you like, the third wave of postmodernity. The present one would label postmodernity as the end of modernism. And it's, it's nothing to do with the future. It's simply to do with the pendulum swung to the opposite. And now we're concerned not with objective reality, but with subjective interpretation. Um, and we've moved up to that phase. And it'd be interesting to look back, because our whole understanding of the organic, of nature, and so on, has all been transformed. The computer's completely changed our understanding of nature and the natural because now it's not so much a thing about form or taxonomy but it's the science of emergence and all the process of emergence and I just think we could have actually talked about these people from a contemporary perspective that would have been very interesting rather than the perspective of 50 years ago uh, that I could extend that but I think that's um, enough and I think we've come to Today we're in a completely different world. Yeah, yeah but it's, can you just finish with one sentence, which is in terms of the question, what 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 was asked for was really the contemporary relevance. That's why I try to make it something that is more useful in terms of the contemporary. So given your work, let's say on Renzo Piano and, and so on, because I think it has a certain, there are certain correlations. Um, can you tell us what do you see? What do you see? What do you yourself see? There were certain um, resonances, and I mean, at times I thought about piano because, in a way, he fuses those two positions. A building like the Kansai Airport, on one level, is a kind of rational machine, but on another level, it's totally organic. 
highly disciplined engineering by the synthesis of many, many different things. Um, in a way, he's the contemporary thing in as much as that um, if the, the computer first it moved biology towards the science of emergence, but it also allows us to accelerate what would be many generations of evolution. A building like that, every element is optimally engineered, but every element has also been integrated through many iterations in, to the next one. So, for instance, the one shape is structure and its skin and its space, and also the movement of air through the building. You know, it has no ducts, the shape varies. So there's a building which you could look at, is this a machine or is it a high, is it an organism? So much of what you're talking about is actually now resolved. The, all those oppositions have come together um, because we're in a different historic era. When Peter Blundell Jones was talking, giving his anthropological examples, Nomea does that. Because the thing about the anthropological examples is that these are pre-literate cultures. So they record meaning in terms of their physical world. When uh, Keanu was designing Nomea, he talked to them and worked with anthropologists and you know, the, the local hut. Well, the central pole is the chief and the other verticals are the males and the, um, the horizontal members and so on are the women that hold the tribe together. And, so on. and constantly when he was working with a client, you know, he designed something, which is in a modern vocabulary, and they'd look at them and they'd say, well, they don't understand that. And the anthropologists would start telling the story until eventually they got a building which has vague resonances with the, the theory. But the thing is that the Canaan culture looked and said, oh, we understand this, this is this, and this is that, and they could tell the story about the world. And that, again, was a, a deeper level of resolution of all these issues. Um, so in some ways, these opposing positions have been brought together at the, at the leading edge of practice, I think. I'll just say, um, just thank you very Wait. much. Sessions that did go uh, far beyond, uh, and I do actually quite disagree with some of the comments made about the conversation staying 50 years ago and 30 years ago. I think it's quite embarrassing that we've got a number of currently practicing architects who put up, and I don't know whether it was the same lecture or different one, but put up works of their own work currently, currently built or being discussed or being investigated. Um, starting on this morning. Sunan, same thing, and we started to look at the way that Sunan wrote the idea of geometry, the importance of geometry, um, that it wasn't just purely a, 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 pragma, a program issue. Um, and then later on, um, um, there was a discussion about the poetry and the importance of poetry and poetry that uh, sadly uh, comes to uh, mention. And also, mostly, uh, kind of hot off the press, Florida's recent. Uh, project from Korea, which also dealt with a different issue of um, sort of function. And uh, at my presentation this morning, I did actually say that today is about what actually are the forces that, for, if you like, for <coughs> our building making or design making or, or, or architecture making. And I think to many extent, um, there weren't opposing you, but there were ways that Please, that we were able to at least throw a few ideas in on the surface, as not only as historians like um, uh, Peter Gordon Jones this morning.